okay, hello, uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad, I'm very happy to uh, um, uh, introducing tonight uh, two uh, very important thinkers. Uh, this is a very short introduction. I will not waste your time uh, uh, on, our, uh, on your right hand side. We have Mr. Jin Ray. Uh, Jin Ray is, uh, in my point of view, in my opinion, one of the uh, major contemporary art theorists uh, in the field of, uh, in the junction between critical theory and art theory. Um, uh, I've, uh, I've been in touch with his thinking, and we, we, with his uh, thought, uh, with his theoretical conceptions uh, since his uh, uh, publications in uh, the third text magazine, which I still consider to be very crucial and important for, uh, for me and I guess for the discussion on contemporary art. Gene's uh, work uh, is, 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 is dedicated to the mapping, to the conceptual mapping of uh, varieties of critical art and, and activism. Uh, one of his ma major works is, I think, his books on uh, uh, terror and the sublime um, uh, art and, in art and critical theory. And uh, uh, his recent works, uh, uh, his recent work and, and, and writings involve uh, a focus on uh, issues of ecology, uh, the biospheric meltdown, and uh, the, the predicament of, of modernity uh, uh, in, in, in total. So, uh, on your left hand side, uh, we are really glad to uh, host uh, Ian Bowl. Ian Bowl is an author, social historian, and an activist, uh, and also a catalyst of the uh, Retort, Retort uh, Collective. Uh, which is a very historical and important uh, collective of uh, artists, uh, thinkers, uh, authors, activists uh, based in uh, uh, the, the Francisco, uh, San Francisco uh, Bay Area. Uh, uh, they have been dealing with the issues of uh, the commons and the commoning, which is a very contemporary, very, very crucial uh, debate uh, in, in, in uh, uh, our uh, milieu. And uh, let me uh, say that uh, one, perhaps one of the most uh, well-known interventions as, as a collective is their response to uh, the, the, the second uh, uh, intervention in, 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 in uh, Iraq by the United States. Um, uh, Ian is a social historian as well, uh, and uh, he will also be focusing on issues regarding uh, the commons, the social history of the commons, and uh, uh, the, the, the uh, importance of um, these issues in today's uh, debate. So this is all uh, about it, and I just pass the microphone to, to Jin Ray for his own uh, introduction. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Costis. Uh, thank you to, to all the organizers uh, for their generous hospitality, and thank you all for for coming out uh, on a, a dreary, rainy Sunday afternoon. Um, I, think, I think I speak for us both uh, in saying that we're, we're happy and honored to be here today uh, to talk about creative um, alternatives to bankruptcy. Um, I think we, we, all, we, we each both uh, have, have a, a long-standing uh, relation as well to, to Greece. Um, in my own case, uh, my wife Anna and I were, were married here in Athens, and uh, we've, been, we've been here um, numerous times over the past four or five years. So um, I think uh, I can say without uh, embarrassment that I, I love this city, and uh, it, it's been very painful to see uh, many of the changes uh, and suffering it's had to endure uh, under the so-called uh, austerity program, more truly called immiseration uh, program. Um, okay, good. So yes, for, for myself, absolutely, I'm, I'm glad to be here to talk about alternatives to bankruptcy. Um, all right, so, so um, as Costis said, uh, Ian, uh, my friend Ian, is uh, 
a social historian, especially of science and technology. Um, he's also one of, uh, I think it's fair to say, a handful of key thinkers of the commons uh, and communism, common, commoning, um, and, uh, and a prime mover of retort, uh, the Berkeley and San Francisco Bay Area Collective that um, has from time to time, among other things, issued some um, crucially important uh, interventions and texts. Um, among them, uh, the book Afflicted Powers, which is a, a powerful um, uh, critical reflection on the, the context and meaning of the war on terror uh, that I, I think is in its second edition now, Ian at Verso. Um, uh, among Ian's other publications are West of Eden, which is a, a collection of essays and uh, reflections on uh, communes and other utopian projects in Northern California. Uh, and his uh, um, uh, new book, which is, uh, will be published soon, is called The Green Machine, A Social uh, History of the Bicycle. So I'm, I'm privileged and, and glad to be here with my friend Ian Bowl. Um, what we wanted to do um, uh, this afternoon is, is lay out uh, some propositions for discussion in three areas uh, that we've been intensely involved with. Um, uh, and we'll do that um, uh, in, in, in good order uh, and leaving enough time for discussion because we want to move as quickly as possible to the point where we can open it up and, and actually um, have a, a, a good discussion with you. Uh, about uh, these issues and the questions they raise uh, also in its local context or implications here. So we propose to talk first about um, the, the very important concept of history from below uh, and also um, the implications of that, um, that concept for, for the archive, uh, for archival practice. Uh, is there something that, we can be call that can be called archiving from below uh, and in that, that context, Ian is going to tell us uh, about a very exciting new radical archive that he's been involved with and that has just opened uh, in London called Mayday Rooms. Um, then we're going to talk about co the commons and commoning. Um, uh, and then finally, we're going to talk a bit about uh, permaculture. Um, and uh, I think we have some images go to go with the first and third parts of that uh, of that lineup. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you, Gene. Can you hear me in the back? All right. Thank you, Gene. And um, yeah, it's good to be here. Thank you, Costas for the invitation. We are honored to be here um, in the stock exchange, the old stock exchange. And congratulations to the, I've just got a copy of the uh, very handsome publication. Uh, useful background reading, I would say, foreground reading, which includes um, an important essay by one of the retort crew, uh, T.J. Clark, those of you who are in the art world or art historians will know of T.J. Clark's work. Um, this essay, A Left With No Future, speaks directly to the crisis uh, both of capital and, and of its opponents. Um, it's a controversial essay. He delivered it in London um, when I organized uh, the spring before last, um, an event that gathered people together to commemorate or celebrate the uprising of the, uh, the weavers in 1811, um, the Luddites, um, about whom the, the left and the right told the same lie, that they were somehow against the future, that they were facing backwards 
that they hated technology. These were skilled artisans at the dawn of modernity. Uh, T.J. Clark's essay in here, which touches also directly on, on the crisis in, in Greece, um, reminded me that I must also immediately just to locate my own interest and, and connection to Greece, which goes back a long time. I didn't know why I started. I was, I was made and came to enjoy learning Greek at the age of six or seven. So I, to the, I, I read and, and speak a little ancient Greek, so you'll have forgive me if I don't address you in uh, ancient Greek, because the stress patterns are all different, and it's all very different. Um, uh, but I w we were very delighted, uh, the retort, when uh, our comrades in Thessaloniki, Leah Yoka and Nikos and Socrates, some of you will know that group, Edition des étrangers, when they translated Afflicted Powers. And I, landing again last evening, I was reminded of this very powerful experience that Joseph Matthews and I had representing retort both in Thessaloniki and Athens and then over in Kanya and in Crete, uh, meeting many comrades dealing, trying to, to think, uh, think through this, this crisis, which of course is, has a deep theoretical implications. I should maybe then just say a few words um, about um, the connection of my long, deep education in ancient Greece, the role of that in, in, in an education in, in a kind of a, in a British, in the British world. I come from Ireland originally, uh, but I was sent to England at the age of six to be educated. And the story, of course, was one in which we, we were invited to believe that uh, the beginnings of, of uh, philosophy and science and logic and everything else. It begins somehow miraculously in the uh, Eastern Aegean. Uh, so without knowing it, I became a historian from very young. But the history I was told, um, I think, was um, as much a burden. And I'm, I, 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 I feel now, and I just want to say it straight out, that. Uh, a tremendous urgency that we have to take seriously the project uh, of telling uh, counter narratives, of telling a different history. Uh, history from below is the phrase uh, that's attached to the project uh, that's associated with the historian E.P. Thompson. Thompson was one of my mentors. I worked with him in the anti-nuclear movement in the 1970s, and then later, um, when I was investigating the, um, the history of commoning and the enclosures in Ireland, I, I worked with Edward uh, just before he died. History from below, um, I, I imagine that the making of the English working class has been translated into Greek, but I may be wrong, I'm not sure. This is a book that came out in 1963, and change the landscape uh, of, of history. It's important for, for, and I, for those of us uh, who are antagonists of empire and capital and, and think of ourselves as on the left, the importance of uh, Thompson's work and the project of history from below is that it directly engage with the dominant history by the left, Marxist history, communist history with a U, communist history, Edward Thompson was a historian trained uh, in Marxism. Um, that tradition of history, of course, went into crisis in the mid-1950s. And what I now can see is that Thompson's work enabled those of us who are operating under the sign of the commons, and we'll come back to more talk about the commons, uh, Tom Thompson, Thompson's great body of work uh, excavates history and retells it in a way 
that challenges some of the fundamental categories, not just of bourgeois, the bourgeois story, but of standard Marxist history. Um, so that's just by way of saying that as a historian, um, I've been operating now for more than a couple of decades and uh, m several in the retort milieu are working within, shall we say, a, a, a communist framework with an O, commoning the commons. Um, we have been in comradely connection with, in particular with the work of George Kofensis, Peter Leinbohr, Silvia Federici, uh, in the ambit of Midnight Notes which has been centered in the east coast of the United States. Some of you will know the work of Midnight Notes. Retort has been focused on the west coast. But both of us, both, both groups which have many cross linkages, take uh, commons as a, a central category. And to understand the common, uh, to understand a common is to have to understand the extinction of the commons, of their privatization, of the enclosure. What George Kofensis did uh, and his group in about 19, in the 1980s was to do something quite daring in terms of the history of left analysis. It was to say that Marx's account of the early history of modernity, of capitalism, which, as Karl Marx said, is a history that has to be told in letters of blood and fire. That capitalism was born in expropriation, in the seizure of the commons, uh, in genocide. Um, and that we now understand that to be an ongoing process not a one-time event in the dawn of modernity. And Edward Thompson's work and his group, the crime group, working at Warwick University from the late 1960s, in which you refuse to talk about crime, but insist that it's always a process of criminalization. Crime should never be presupposed, uh, but that it, but that, but that in order to understand the history of capital and capitalism, one has to understand it as a process of enclosure, of criminalization, and judicial atrocity. The moment of enclosure, it turns out, is also the moment of the invention of the police force uh, and of the invention of economics as a discourse. The world's first economist is the Reverend Malthus. He's employed by the East India Company. He's appointed in the year 1800. And it is he, population Malthus, who sets the terms under which we now have to live. Um, and Literally, the world of, co of commodities, the, wo the world of the, of the Bloomberg array, these, these, these are the colors of, of capital. You know the Bloomberg array? It's a, it's a workstation that the, that the traders sit in front of as they do their work. Um, If you do a course in economics, you understand pretty quickly. You take it in and, you, and it, it's just naturalized that the science of economics is defined by Malthus and ever since um, in three words. Choice under scarcity. Choice under scarcity. Okay. Now, where does that scarcity come from? Well, we'll talk later, I think, to hand back to Jean, and we can have a conversation about what Costa said, the biospheric meltdown. We, there is, if you like, a crisis of nature, that's for sure.
But for a large part of what we face, the scarcity, of course, is, as they say, socially constructed and enforced by the police force, which is invented, the world's first modern police force, um, is found in London at the moment of the imposition of the wage form, the crushing of the commons, the entry into the world of the modern commodity. So we have to understand scarcity, uh, enclosure, commons. And that history is obscured. It's been obscured by by left analysis, as well as by the dominant bourgeois analysis. And history comes down to us in shards and fragments. There's very little that survives. Voices from below are very rare. Um, I, I'm ashamed to say I don't know the history of, say, Greek peasant poets, but the beauty of of um, balladry and, f and, and what is called folk music. And I was just talking to Athena just now about the embarrassment about the categories of, of music in this way. Um, we, we, need, we need to look in strange places to do this history. And so I'm just going to, before I hand back to Jean, just to connect this little proto-analysis of the perspective of commoning, the importance of commoning as a, as a kind of pushback against the commodity. The common, the right of common, of uncommodified access to livelihood, is what modernity was there to snuff out, to extinguish. And the new enclosures, of, and Greeks above all are experiencing that like nobody else in Europe right now, the new enclosures, um, we have to understand them in a historical light. And that is why um, a group of us came together in 2008 to see uh, what might be said and how we might proceed given how little of our own history from below has survived and what we might do about it. We had a, a gathering in the Bay Area, organized by the Retort uh, Gang, called Archives of Dissent. We found that there was a very similar set of conversations happening elsewhere, in Bangalore, in Berlin, in Copenhagen, um, in London. Uh, and a group of us sat down for a series of conversations over about two years, and the end result is that we have started a, a if you like, a counter-institution. We don't call it an institute, uh, but as Costa said, it is, it is called uh, the Mayday Rooms. Mayday, of course, is a, has a double meaning, because uh, on the one hand, it is the festival uh, of the better world that we intend, and secondly, it is the international distress signal. So Mayday Rooms is uh, two things. It's, in, it's, it, it, it's an attempt to rescue history, and to animate that history for a, to ignite a better future on the one hand uh, and uh, secondly it's um, yeah it's the distress signal and it's the it's the festival so it's a it's a social space it's a space for animating it, it, it's a space in that sense like this one the importance of these spaces has never been more obvious we know from the way in which they come to crush the Occupy movement. So, one of our group, by an accident of birth, happens to be rich. It's useful. <laughs> and um, we decided after a while that it was crucial that we have a space. Uh, that we could not, in all conscience, if we were going to offer uh, our cell Mayday Rooms as a safe haven for threatened histories, for gathering our histories, uh, that it, it could not be as precarious as those histories and collections that were being threatened. 
threatened why? By, indeed by the new enclosures, by the forces of neoliberalism neoliber as they evicted and closed in on the spaces, the social de democratic spaces that have been partially a partial um, home for, for example, women's history. The women's history building in East London, those of you who know London, it was a stunning surprise to discover that the London Metropolitan University decided simply to sell the building. It was unimaginable that this could happen, but the unimaginable is happening all over the place. So we found, we found a building in, of all places, Fleet Street. And here it is, 88 Fleet Street, right in the heart of the city. Uh, here's a view uh, in 1890s when this building was built. That's the spire of St. Bride's. This is the home of journalism. The world's first movable type printing press is set up in what is now the churchyard. Uh, that is the Reuters building on the right and uh, 88 Fleet Street on the left. It was the home of the Birmingham Post. Here it is uh, in its current state. Uh, it's five stories high. Uh, it was been empty for some years and uh, we have acquired it uh, for the work of Mayday Rooms. Um, It's right on Fleet Street. That beautiful, modern building across the road, again, those of you who know London, that is the Daily Express building, a beautiful building, the Black Lubyanka. Now, of course, Murdoch smashed the unions, and so there's no, there's no uh, printing going on in Fleet Street anymore. Just up the road is the Stalinist frontage of the, on, on just on the sort of left, on the other side, is the, the Daily Telegraph building. I'm coming to a, a close now, but I wanted just to say that Fleet Street itself, the political logic of the social geography of Fleet Street is important. This is Fleet Street. It's the, one of the great arteries of state, so that Mark, Mrs. Thatcher's body came down Fleet Street. Fleet Street is the old medieval path that connects finance power with state power. Whitehall at one end, on the, off to the left, up past the law courts, and money power to the right by the stock exchange there, St. Paul's, which is just 300 meters up the hill, right? Occupy London was on, was on that space. Again, the logic is clear that the reason that all the revolutionary pamphleteering and the Fleet Street newspapers are on this path and the reason that the law courts are there is that that's why the I mean, it's obvious that the press and the law are going to cluster along that path. And instead of being, as most people expected us, to look for a place in Hackney or Peckham or where the slopy-haired people are, the swoopy hairs, um, that we've gone back to the high center. You know, we've, this is our world. We belong to it. I mean, you know, we've got the, the, the banksters are right opposite, uh, but we deserve this. Why not? Um, and the job is to, it's a job of animation and I, I want to insist that uh, we take uh, at least as seriously, more seriously than being a repository, because the Tate, the Tate Museum, the Tate, the, the, the Tate are very uh, assiduous now in, in hoovering up, in vacuuming up uh, the work of artists for adding value later. For us, it's, it's a living archive we're interested in, in animating the past right now. Uh, aren't we meeting today under, what's the question? Uh, what now, right? What now? Um, I'm going to stop now, but just to say that here's George Cofensis at the end, opening the boxes of his first batch of archives from the Midnight Notes history the Committee for Academic Freedom in Africa, which he and Sylvia set up in the mid-80s as a response when they understood that the commons in Africa were being enclosed. 
that structural adjustment really is a new form of these old enclosures. Not perhaps written so much in blood and fire, but with a stroke of a pen, which later became, of course, the project uh, that was upset in Seattle in 1999. Um, we are assiduous again in drawing maps, in, in trying to map these histories in order that we can understand the past and to think ahead. And again, so I finished just with, I'm, Costas mentioned the West of Eden. I just want to say that the passion for me about having a space is that I became living in the Bay Area since, uh, since the 1980s, understanding the, um, how important these spaces are because it was clear that the last time there was a burst of anti-capitalist communalism, uh, the state came down very, very hard with bulldozers. Now these efforts in the 60s and 70s to just turn your back on the system, uh, go out often into the countryside. In here, in this case, of course, it was uh, the Bucky Dome, <laughs> the utopian form of commoning. Um, but it happened all over the place. This is the island of Alcatraz. Indians of all nations seized the island of Alcatraz, which was a derelict maximum supermax prison in the San Francisco Bay. You might know it. Uh, they went commoning. Um, it was a world of, um, that rejected the commodity form. It's very hard to do. We can talk about the practicality of that in a minute. Um, some of it looked retro, quite regressive. This is one of the rural communes. It looks like there's something out of uh, uh, a pre-modern world of, uh, you know, playing the red man. Uh, People's Park in Berkeley. Again, the state comes down very hard. They beat heads, they kill people, there's tear gas. We've been here before. We have to connect these old struggles with the contemporary struggles now right here uh, in Athens and elsewhere. And I want to tell you, that I bring, I bring um, comradely greetings from, from the Bay Area. Uh, uh, and there are many people watching what happens here out of sympathy and solidarity. We know it's, it's very serious and we have work to do. The island of Alcatraz was taken back after 19 months. The Black Panther commoning programs were smashed by COINTELPRO and a, a ruthless state. Uh, we must acknowledge the defeats, but we must try to understand why they are so keen to not let us have any spaces. So this question of space is enormously important. And then just the last image, which again I address those of you who, who are interested in, in art, in, in visual culture, in the question of figuring our, our plight, and in a conversation earlier today with Jean, we came to discuss the difficulty of imaging this world of, of, of commoning, of uncommodified life. How do you figure friendship or rights to rights of common? Um, this is a famous classic 19th century painting. Um, what's going on here? Anybody know? I don't know what the word is in Greek. They didn't teach me that at age six. But these are, these are women gleaning. Some of you will know Agnes Varda's film, The Gleaners and I, Contemporary Gleaning. This is the right of commoners, uh, even when land is uh, owned by a big landowner. This is the right to gather what is left over during harvest. Um, investigations by Edward Thompson and his crew discovered um, that the right to pick up the corn 
the seed left over from the harvest, which went into the barns belonging, of course, to the lord of the manor. Uh, in local conditions, the right to glean might amount to three months' bread in the year. Okay, so around about 1800, the right of gleaning in, in England is snuffed out. This is done in Parliament, all right? And at Seattle in 1999, that is what the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund had in mind for the commoners of the world, all right? So this is what we face. Um, I'll stop there and let uh, Jean get in. Thanks, uh, thanks, Ian. Uh, be before we turn to commenting, I just... Um, would like to try to recoup a couple a couple ideas and in, in what Ian has said and and uh, to start with just restate the the obvious I mean the the reason why this 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 question of who writes history and how do we do the archives and uh, I think Mayday Rooms is interesting not just in the content of the art the radical content of the archives it's it's now hosting but also the whole, the whole way the archive is organized in terms of uh, accessibility and so on. The reason this problem is so, um, so urgent and crucial is because uh, our, our understanding of the present moment and our place in it and what's possible to do, what it's possible to do today um, or at any moment um, is shaped by the narratives, fictional, factual, uh, and otherwise, the histories that surround uh, the present moment and that we inherit. And these histories, you know, it, it's been well said, these histories are, are inevitably um, the ones we come to know, the dominant ones, written by the victors of the last struggles. They, they not only exclude the experiences and aspirations of those who were defeated, um, but they, they restrict the imagination. They, they try to exclude the possibility of, uh, uh, of any other world. And in that sense, the, the neoliberal fantasy the, uh, uh, of the end of history, this post-histoire moment that was ushered in by Reagan and, and Thatcher and that we probably saw the end of uh, not until the crisis of 2000, 2008 or so, uh, was the ultimate attempt to inscribe uh, uh, one final history from above that would forever and all time exclude any possibility of alternatives. So um, it's, it's, it's for this reason to, to reclaim the ability to imagine, first of all, just to imagine uh, something different and remember that other people have, have struggled and fought for worlds other than this one. It's not the only one. Um, and, and that was the, the, the importance and novelty of asserting uh, back in the 90s, 1990s, this idea that there is an alternative was an answer to just that problem. Um, in what Ian has, has just told us about Malthus and uh, the importance of the idea of scarcity, I think that, cur that connects and, and helps us to understand this moment of austerity. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a direct... Uh, progression from scarcity to austerity. Uh, why is nothing else possible than the suffering? Because there's not enough of anything to go around. It has to be like this. Um, good, okay, so I think and hope that there's, there's plenty there that we can discuss uh, uh, both in, in the idea of, of, of history itself but in the, the nuts and bolts of, of archives. I, I think there are people that, that may be interested in that and um, perhaps there are, um, there are local radical archives or experiments in this direction that might be similar that should be mentioned and, and recognized and that we could talk about. But, okay, on, on now to the commons. Um, the idea of the commons, uh, I'm going to let Ian explain, but I just want to say that um, the practice of, of commoning, of course, goes, goes back uh, some centuries. Um, but uh, the history of, of the commons as a concept in radical political history um, also has a long history that um, isn't necessarily known by all the new readers of, of Michael Hardin and Tony Negri's uh, Commonwealth. 
Um, it's it's um, it certainly um, needs to be acknowledged that that that, that book uh, published a couple years ago has created a tremendous amount of excitement about the idea of the commons, uh, which is well and good, um, but um, unfortunately, I don't think they gave uh, credit to the people uh, on on whose work they're building. So I'm going to ask uh, Ian if he would um, give us a, a short history of. Uh, the, hi the, the, the lineage, if you will, of, of this idea of, of commoning, enclosure, the new enclosures, uh, the rethinking by people like uh, uh, Kof George Kofensis and Midnight Notes of um, Marx's concept of uh, so-called primitive accumulation uh, and what that means for us today. Thank you, Gene, yeah. Just checking in, are we doing all right? How are we doing? Is it, is it annoying? I mean, am I holding it about right? Is it okay? Okay. Yes, okay. Uh, just a little word on, on the commons and, and, and its history. Um, when Edward Thompson convened the crime group, as it was called, around him, um, in 1965 onwards. <coughs> um, as I said already, he was fighting against, um, he was already in a struggle against the official line um, as, uh, as somebody who'd been in the communist historians group with theoretical uh, allegiance to Moscow in the 1940s and, and 50s. Um, he found that in his work on the 18th century, um, that uh, the category of, of um, rulers and, and proletarians was inadequate to capture the dynamics uh, of the social change and transformation. He became extremely interested in a whole series of a massive expansion of capital, capital offenses, 50 brought in under the notorious Black Act against people who were poaching, um, taking stuff from the forest, smugglers, um, and he and his students um, discovered that there was a world uh, of livelihood um, that had been overlooked in a, a Marxist historiography that turns out not to be very interested in the commons or to see it as primitive, as residual, as backward. So when I mention the fact that um, that gleaning could mean the difference between starvation and not. That became, has become very important in the analysis um, of George Gofensis and so on. When you hear in the news that um, somebody in South America or in Africa is living on you know, one euro a week or a month or even a day, uh, you think, well, how is that possible? What that tells you is that actually that there's a world, uh, there's a world of commoning still going on. And what do we mean by that? Well, it simply means access to the means of livelihood. Most of that world has disappeared from the English-speaking world. I'd be interested to know about the terminology in Greek. So if I mention those of you... Um, I mean, I'll be very surprised if anybody here knows what Estovers is, E-S-T-O-V-E-R-S. -E Almost no native English speakers know what that is. What is Chiminich? Um, Chiminich, Estovers, Panich. This belongs to a world that was crushed, that was extinguished. These were very important rights. Estovers turns out to be the, the right to take wood for fuel. 
This is a world that has now been revived for us by one of Edward Thompson's close young comrades, Peter Lineball. Some of you will know his work, The London Hang, The Magna Carta Manifesto. I commend to you The Magna Carta Manifesto. What Peter Lineball has shown is that commoning um, is everywhere. Now, this comes as no surprise when we realize that it also often is the world of shadow work. It's the world of social reproduction, the world uh, on which the possibility of factory production of the kinds of things that get into national accounts. So, so much of the figures that we see on the wall and the figures that show up on, uh, in national systems of accounting on which the United Nation depends um, is essentially a fiction, or at least it's parasitic on, on the world of the commons. So although we say, yet yes, the commons are being extinguished, rights to uh, the leftovers from the harvest, to the downward, to what's left over in the production of artisans, often these people were being hanged for taking a small piece of cloth, to which they were entitled historically, the criminalization of these customary takings was part of the capitalist project to impose the wage form, which drives a wedge between wage work and unwaged work, which is a highly gendered separation, of course. So part of the project of history from below, and we've been very much helped by the work of um, Federici and others in the Wages for Housework campaign and so on in revealing this world that uh, still exists. I mean, think of all the work that goes uncompensated, all right? So that, that history still has to be recovered. It's quite shocking to read the Magna Carta Manifesto and see it not as just a struggle between barons and the king, but actually a struggle from below in which these rights of common uh, are asserted and guaranteed. That is a victory for, for commons. Now, most left history has, uh, has had no interest in that. If you read Eric Hobsbawm's uh, history of the 20th century. Um, again, we want to honor Eric Hobsbawm. He was one of the communist historians group. He wrote about primitive rebels. He wrote about the Luddites. And yet, because he was a good communist and a modernist and state, I mean, he, Eric, you know, God bless his memory, you know, he thinks like a state. He's a, he's a state socialist in that way. Right. He was embarrassed by the Luddites. He understood them. He understood that it was not irrational, although he wished they'd waited and gone through channels because the trade unions weren't up and running at that point. Um, but the point is um, that um, I can more or less only just assert it now, but I want to argue for taking uh, a communist perspective in which value um, uh, does not come from these, you know, Malthu this Malthusian world of economics, right, in which we're invited to to put to to monetize. Um, to monetize our uh, desire to keep, you know, the whale. Or the, they ask, well, if you like to save the whales or a forest, well, pony up. What's it worth to you? Tell us what it's worth. The point is that Malthus and his tribe are the ones who ruthlessly excluded commoning. They presuppose, uh, they, they claim that the, the earth, the land, nature is a, is a commodity in a way that widgets are coming out of a factory, and it's not true. 
He'll get to, the, to, the, to nature and the crisis of nature in a moment, perhaps. Uh, so the science of economics calls these things externalities, in which nature becomes the sewer and the sink, as do our own bodies. Uh, so we have to we, we have to rethink uh, the science <coughs> excuse me, um, of economics for this young chap, the generation coming up, those who come after. Right? We can't go on like this. We we have to jettison uh, economics of a standard left or right variety. It's very hard to know exactly how to do this um, because some of that struggle, unfortunately, must go on still in their terms. Maybe you will remember uh, Larry Summers, who was chief economist at the World Bank, later head of CEO of Harvard University. Larry Summers wrote a memo, an internal memo, at the World Bank, which was leaked out. And they were talking to themselves. He said something honest inside to themselves. It was quite honest. He said, surely on our theory, and by that he meant Malthusian, Hosean assumptions, our theory of cost-benefit analysis, of externalities, of waste. He said, on our theory, isn't the third world very under-polluted? The third world is under-polluted. Well, that is true. I mean, he was honest in that sense. On their theory, in which the commons is essentially, uh, the uncommodified commons, is, it doesn't really matter. I mean, capitalists are having to kind of internalize bits of it, but they said it doesn't really matter. It's a sink, it's a waste, it's an externality. Shouldn't we be dumping our northern waste in the global south? This is at a time when barge, a barge was wandering around the Atlantic looking for somewhere that would take it in, maybe in West Africa or something. Right? The logic of that, right, the logic is clear. That early deaths by people in the third world is less expensive than a northerner because of lifetime income is less, right? So this is the, the, the grotesque logic of the system we are in. Now, the Minister of the Environment in Brazil wrote to, to Summers and said, you know, your language uh, is disgusting, but your logic is impeccable, right? You should be ashamed of yourself. Um, and, and a couple of weeks later, there was a resignation. Not of Summers, by the way, of the Minister of the Environment. So that is the situation we find ourselves in. The, the world of commoning, uh, of the rights to appropriation, uh, to water, to the fruits of the earth, all these um, are in the sights of capital. And in my meeting with the comrades in Kanya, in, in, uh, in Crete, it turned out that there was a focus on the grain that the gleaners are after. Because these seeds are the gift of nature to the farmer, right? They are outside the commodity system. They are a common. Historically, they are a common, right? So grains are uh, a Janus-faced object. They face both ways. They're a commodity. Uh, they are a product, which you turn into bread, whatever. And they're also a means of production for the harvest next year. Now, what genetically modified organisms is really about is to turn this grain into a commodity, to bring the, to bring the farmers of Crete, of Greece, of the world overall bring them to market each year, okay. It's a scandal for the capitalist, for capitalist agriculture. 
that there should be this gift to the commoners of the world. It's a scandal. And they wish to monetize it. And that's what their game is really about. It's not really about increasing yield. It's about barcoding and privatizing and making proprietary claims on what is a common. There is much to be said more about the commons and the variety of them. It's a very heterogeneous form and part of the history that Mayday and others, and I invite you to join in this project, those of you who think this is of some interest, um, to get to grips with this form. It's uh, when Karl Marx said that the commodity form was complex and full of metaphysical subtleties. Well, the common form is too. And uh, again, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Ian. Okay, I'll need some help now uh, to switch to the other images. Okay, um, while that's going on, um, yeah, he, he's going he's gonna to do that, Ian, so that's okay. So, okay, so um, some questions then uh, perhaps for the discussion would be, um, thinking about what Ian said is, it, 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 yes, j just um, access that whole group and we'll just start them in a, in a loop, please. Um, one question would be um, for, for Ian is, do you see commoning um, pri primarily as a practice or as an organizational form? Uh, in other words, is this a an everyday practice based on, on claiming uh, resources and, and self-organizing them um, on a different logic? Or um, is, it, is its value um, located more uh, as the form that sort of fills the gap between local and global? Um, or both, okay? All right, so... Um, Thank you, Ian. On, on to the third and last uh, sort of topic before we, we open it up. Um, uh, permaculture and the biospheric, biospheric meltdown. Um, and here uh, we, we had originally hoped that um, our artist and our artist friend Nils Norman, who works in this area, would, would uh, present uh, this part on permaculture. But as he can't make it, uh, I'm, I'm going to attempt to do it. Um, I've needed to, to write some notes down, so if you indulge me, I'm just going to read a, a couple pages uh, while these images keep going around. So I'll refer to them obliquely a little bit. But uh, All right, so I, I begin with the idea of biospheric meltdown. And here I mean uh, global uh, warming and climate change, but also a drastic loss of biodiversity through species extinction. I'm going to um, make some propositions in a kind of polemical mode here to facilitate uh, discussion. Um, and, and I know that, <laughs> I hope that will be, will be welcome. Um, I want to say that these are an inescapable and urgent challenge that has to be central to any political strategy aiming to reduce and abolish domination and misery. If we want to know what the price of indifference to this biospheric problem is likely to be in everyday political terms, we just need to call to mind the vicious attacks on immigrants and the rise of the golden dawn here. Uh, here in Greece, we can see how enforced austerity and immiseration are producing the conditions and the climate for fascism. Now consider the global asymmetries of meltdown, the resource wars, displacements, and movement of tens of millions of ecological refugees that will be set in motion by a two to four degrees of global warming. Uh, and we can see that without doubt, climate denialism is gonna make some, for some very ugly border and, and, and identity politics. So I want to argue that we can't continue to push the ecological crisis to the margins as a secondary problem, something to think about and get around to after we've fought off austerity and uh, rebuilt the welfare state. 
giving automatic priority to the economic and social crisis, misses or misrecognizes how the bio meltdown must assert itself in its, in its relentless materiality as the major constraining factor that in the end will shape all politics and all horizons of liberation. So my remarks and propositions here are, are offered for discussion in this light. All right, meeting this challenge, I think, would mean transforming the way society interacts with nature. The treatment of nature under capitalist modernity, uh, some of these images um, are showing us, has been characterized by a violence that is shocking in its ferocity and recklessness. The drive for accumulation has been pursued with a kind of real and absolute blindness to ecological consequences. So man-made uh, or anthropogenic global warming is just one feature of uh, this destructive and ultimately self-destructive relation to nature. So certainly the idea of nature itself is a cultural construct. Ecosystems, in fact, are always changing. The planet and human society are continuously impacting each other. The problem isn't to find our way back to some pristine wildness or lovable mother nature. But then we don't need to romanticize or idolize nature to grasp the need to transform this relation from unrestricted human exploitation to something aiming more at symbiosis, cooperation, mutual benefit. This is my proposition. So the biosphere, the atmosphere, the planet supply and circulation of water, these, I think, are the largest commons we have. The fight to defend them against enclosure and omnicidal destruction has all the features of the struggles that Ian spoke about earlier. In thinking about this challenge, I've tried to take seriously the idea that the human relation to nature can be seen most clearly in the way we organize the primary production that satisfies our most basic needs. So in other words, the way we grow and produce our food and the manner in which we make shelter and inhabit the places we live. The rest largely unfolds from that. So the dominant um, officially promoted strategy for feeding the world, undoubtedly, is the mega scale industrial monoculture increasingly supported by genetic engineering. Under this model, whole forests are burned and bulldozed, and whole countrysides of traditional mixed farms are taken over and remade into eerie landscapes of soy or corn or rice, or else vast concentration camps packed with bear life in the form of chickens, cows, or hogs. With fish and shrimp farms, industrial monoculture is extending into the seas. So the, the UN, the World Bank, the EU, and technocrats of nearly every state on the planet energetically promote this model. Actually promote is far too tame a word for the coercion and enforcement involved. And they don't support the spread of this model because it's the best way to grow safe, healthy, high quality food. Factually, it's not, as I think we all know. Industrial monoculture requires continuous artificial respiration through massive inputs of chemicals, toxins, and petroleum products that inevitably enter the food chain and wind up in our bodies. The destruction of soils and biodiversity is not limited to the factory farms themselves. The nitrates and toxins travel down the watersheds and pour into the seas where they feed algae blooms and dead zones. So why the push and hype for this model then? Simply because big agro is high profit and fully integrated into the global economy. That's the short answer. Powerful multinationals, think Monsanto, Syngenta, Dow, Arthur Daniels Midland, lobby and steer the technocrats and effectively get to write the laws 
that legalize enclosure, the new enclosures. On a planetary scale, the consequences are dire. Agriculture is the single largest source of greenhouse gas emissions, accounting for 35% of all carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide released by humans. And irrigation accounts for more than 70% of all human water consumption. So big agro's blind drive for profit, subverting the very biosphere it depends on, epitomizes the dangerous regressive irrationalities of the capitalist relation to nature. The model is ecologically and socially bankrupt, but there are alternatives. Permaculture and organic urban horticulture are known available methods of producing safe, sustainable food. Combining insights of ecological science with traditional and indigenous forms of knowledge, permaculture has grown since its inception in the early 1970s into something like an emerging social movement. Working with, rather than suppressing, local processes of natural succession and symbiosis, permaculture nudges the garden landscape toward productive edible forests. Once mature, edible forests don't require continuous applications of water and fertilizers. At the same time, they give a needed boost to biodiversity and counter the rush to mass extinction. So that, for me, is a revolution in food production that also models a new human relation to nature. The points I want to emphasize is that what is at stake is nothing less than the biospheric commons. The struggle around food production, the struggles around food production, flare up on all levels of everyday life. They could be central to the politics that David Harvey and others have called the right to the city. Through permaculture and organic horticulture, cities could become largely self-sufficient in fruits and vegetables, an incredibly important potential if we're talking about alternatives to bankruptcy and the real material bases for autonomy and independence from technocratic domination. So permaculture, my proposition, permaculture along with community gardens and guerrilla gardens is not just a better and sustainable form of food production, which it is, but it's a form of political resistance to a technocratic monocultural world imposed on us from above. States and capital are evidently more invested in defending business as usual than in protecting us from the effects of biospheric meltdown. Permaculture, in the broadest sense, and as a social movement, is a grassroots response to this challenge. Its project of reclaiming the biospheric commons in very situated and localized ways, I think, is an early form of mitigation and adaptation from below. So, I'm not arguing, just to be clear, that we all now have to become organic gardeners, permaculturalists, and craftsmen, as, as good an idea as that might be. But I am arguing that we should recognize that we share a stake in the struggles of those who do make such decisions, and that we should support and defend their right to do so against the enforcements of technocratic capital and big agro. So I know there are many um, and vibrant community initiatives and neighborhood initiatives in Athens that, that push exactly in this direction. Uh, I've been showing some images uh, of Parking Parco, uh, I think it's called in English, the self-organized uh, community gardens, orchard and park, uh, created on uh, Navarino in Exarchia uh, by occupying a parking lot space in 2009 and importantly, holding it since then. Uh, and in this light, I, I, I think that's a, a model we have a lot to learn from. Okay, so I've, I've polemically um, thrown those out uh, for discussion. I'm, I'm glad to, <laughs> to um, go over them more. And sh should we then open it up, Ian? Okay. Uh, we have two mics. Um, we can share one, and, and uh, there are questions. Thank you.
you very much for your presentation. I would like to ask something about the main rooms, uh, May Day rooms. Mm -hmm. um, you said, if I understood it correctly, that you believe that um, since you, this archive is very important because certain struggles of the past are connected to certain struggles of today. So I was wondering if you could say um, a few more things about actions you organize uh, toward this awareness to the public in relation to the archive, or if you have some things about ar archival ar activism. I don't know, reenactments or, uh, you know. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Um, an appropriate, uh, an appropriate question. Um, <coughs> so we're just at the beginning, uh, but already we're seeing interesting results from the approach we're taking. Um, let me give you one example that might help exemplify, uh, and, uh, and, and I hope um, be part of an answer. Um, uh, one of the Mayday Rooms gang um, was working at uh, Central St. Martin's at the art, the art School, which has just m moved. Those of you who know the art scene in, in, uh, in London has moved from its famous site in um, uh, Charing Cross Road up to King's Cross Station. And a lot of, there's a lot of danger when institutions or, uh, or organizations move. It's an opportunity to to weed, to cull, to get rid of stuff. We found that after the earthquake in San Francisco uh, in 89, um, they were dumping hundreds of thousands of books at night um, to get rid of them because the new library, which was a, uh, a corrupt development uh, anyway, uh, had less room than the old one, and so they were getting rid of it. Now, it so happened that the, the history of the art school, some of it, was found lying in the stairwell in black bags, um, you know, in pools of water. And we were able to rescue some of that. And one of the interesting things that happened is that the current students uh, at Central St. Martins um, have been working with the history of the institution that is now being indexed and catalogued and uh, brought back to life. The current students are able to understand the history of their own institution in order to uh, be more effective and critical um, in their struggle uh, against the neoliberalization of the institution. For example, um, it turns out that uh, the new art school has very little space for anybody doing sculpture. They're, they like art. They like art that is, uh, as they say, 2D, two, di two dimensions. They like people working on screens because it doesn't take up any space. Anybody who wants to go painting, um, they don't like painting, certainly not with oils because the oil takes a long time to, to dry and they want people to take their artwork away at night and come back the next day with a wheelie. Um, all this uh, takes on a new light when considered um, in the light of the history that was lying there and is now being animated in Mayday rooms. What we understand from now, for example, from the, the drawings that we found from 1939 was that actually this uh, fantasy that con the current students had, that things were great in the, in the 60s, you know, the obsession with the 60s, 
uh, that it was all great and it was groovy and, and it was very radical. It turns out that these drawings reveal that what happened in the 60s, and it was indeed interesting in the 70s, there was radical pedagogy going on, for sure, very interesting project, but that, that what happened in the 70s at this art school uh, was itself the result of a struggle. When you look at these drawings, you find that actually this building was conceived and constructed uh, uh, fully within the logic of the commodity, uh, that it was intended to produce, uh, admittedly in a kind of interesting Bauhaus type structure, it was a factory for producing people who were going to work in textiles and in fashion, all the things that we might think of now as part of the, as to regret, you know, how close to market people have to be, the commodification of students. This is just one example I'm trying to give of the way in which the material that's coming into us now um, is useful um, in imagining uh, a different history uh, and suggesting ways in which the struggle might be uh, continued. And I could tell that story uh, over, for example, um, the history of uh, uh, the resistance to, uh, um, to cuts, to, to, uh, to austerity, uh, to um, uh, documentary film, uh, to the history of animation. We have all kinds of interesting materials coming in of various kinds. Uh, uh, the suppressed history of uh, radical, ther radical therapy uh, inside and outside um, the National Health Service. Uh, the history of the anti-university uh, is very helpful in, in, in thinking how we should uh, organize, uh, again, uh, radical experiments in pedagogy. So the question is a great one, and it's not like we have the answers. All we're committed to is um, bringing especially different generations together to work through materials, to index it in idiosyncratic vernacular ways, um, to ask that people who work with the archives not, don't leave it in a pristine way as you do when you go into the, if you go into the National Archives here in Athens, you, it, they will insist that you leave it exactly as you found it. We, we want to turn that upside down. We say to people coming to work in the, at Mayday Rooms Archives, you must leave traces. <laughs> you must leave traces which will be used or not used by the people who come later to ratchet up to, as it were, to contribute to this uh, growing, as it were, history from below. I hope that has, has helped a little bit, but thank you for the question. Hello, um, I would like to ask Ian, he made an interesting point about leaving the old right, left uh, history and focusing, because it's kind of, n and focusing on the other side that has been neglected, like the history of commons. Um, it's a really interesting point. Is that a personal view or have you seen a movement, let's say, in in research to focus on the other side that has been neglected so far. Because in my experience at least, I find historians having a hard time to see something else apart from the left-right polariz polarization. Thank you again. Terrific, terrific question. And it speaks to the, the challenge that, that Jean um, just um, before he started reading that splendid passage on 
whether the com whether a common is is a, is a is to be thought of as a resource, uh, a physical thing, perhaps, um, or a set of social relations. I mean, in a way, I think it's both. I don't like the language of resources, let alone, you know, human resources. You know, the reduction, resourcism, I think, is to be resisted. Um, but, but certainly, um, uh, I think, um, When we use the word commoning, we're, we are hinting at something important, which is that it, it's, a, it's a set of social relations, uh, and it's rather hard to image, to figure, but it's also very, very hard. It, uh, typically, it's not written down. So the historian, again, historically, historians are focused on you know, the documentary record. How do we get to this world of of commoning, of social reproduction, of the shadow work. It's extremely, it's extremely difficult. It requires quite a lot of creative work. So for example, um, Edward Thompson and his group went looking in very strange places. Peter Leinbohr, in his great excavation of the, of the commons, of, of the right to take all kinds of materials left over from the production of, you know, uh, of silk, of dresses, uh, of hats, uh, uh, of building. He, he went to um, these little biographies <coughs> of men, it was mostly men, who were hanged for stealing, quote. Again, this was a criminalization, right? I mean, this was stuff to which, until very recently, they were entitled to this stuff, right? Uh, they were entitled to it. So that, for example, if you go round, again, this is, this is work that's only recently being done by a friend of mine in dockyards around, for example, um, the royal shipyards in Britain. People working in the shipyards were entitled at the end of every day to carry out anything, any timber, less than a meter, a meter or less, anything they could carry. They were entitled to that until it was criminalized, okay? So if you go around the dockyards, you find buildings around, you know, uh, built around uh, late 18th, early 19th century. A lot of it will be made of timber three foot or less, in other words, you could say, uh, are these timbers, are they, are they commons? Not really. It's the right of common, it's a social relation that this person is in, in relation certainly to a piece of the material world. But I wouldn't want to call the piece of timber a common. In fact, I want to make sure, I want to say something very, very make myself very clear on this point. Okay, I think we've got to see it as a as a as as a relation certainly to to the material world but for example let me give the two examples in the case of this timber um, it's uh, it's not it's not a commodity. Um, is it a common? No, I don't think it's a common. Or if you call it a common, remember we must distinguish common from public. Okay, Public is not the same as common. We need a three-way distinction here between private, public, and common. A commonist perspective is not the same as public. Um, a public library, which we like, you know, anybody can, can take a book, you know, you could say. Um, it's for all. Commons are not quite like that, right? A common, the right of common is for those for whom that part of the material world is relevant. Often it will be quite local, okay? It's not for everybody, right? 
the right of common is for those for whom that livelihood, it, it, it might, it, it's quite circumscribed, okay? Um, another historical example. For the commoners of North America, when the Anglos were moving west to enclose the continent in the genocidal assault on the native peoples of North America, the, uh, the American state declared these lands uh, public lands, right? Public lands in the Northwest Ordinance in the 1780s and 90s, right? Now, that category public, if you were um, Tecumseh, if you were... Uh, or the young Shawnee warriors who were trying to push back against the enclosure, when they heard the word public, for them that is a nightmare. Because <laughs> public turns out to be a, in the minds of those thinking like a state, is, it's a status term, it's a status term. Public is a category that is a temporary one. It's on the way to privatization, right? You declare those lands public, and then when enough of Anglos get there, it becomes privatized, okay? Let me take another related example. The glory of North America, as those of you who know who've been there, is the public, is, is the public lands, the public parks. They're very beautiful. I mean, we're very proud of those. And there's some wonderful work done in them, particularly during the great emergent 20th century emergency of capital um, in the New Deal. Um, now, when Yosemite in California was made a public park at the moment of emparkment, turns out we have to see that also as a moment of enclosure. All right? It was open to the public, but it was enclosed to the commoners. So at the moment that Yosemite is made a public park, at that moment is criminalized in just the same way that Peter Leinbaugh is talking about the criminalization of the customary takings of artisans. At that moment, those who take their livelihood on the Pacific littoral, all the native peoples for thousands of years, for example, the mushrooms, the ferns, the downward, all these, the right of commons, they are extinguished. That's gone, okay, in the name of the public. So it's a complicated, again, I'm saying common form is complex, it's heterogeneous, it has an interesting and difficult relationship to the category public. Um, as you know, left history has been very state focused, and um, so have historians. So I think this question is, is an extremely good one. Uh, and I do believe that um, feminist historiography is going to be a very large part of the recovery of the history of these sets of social relations. And they've got to be done imaginatively, because a lot of it, of course, is oral history. There's a lot of commoning still going on. We know that half the world's food, to pick up on, on Jean's beautiful meditation on agribusiness versus this other thing, Half the world's food is still produced not as commodity, but directly for use. I'm not saying there isn't relations of exploitation. Patriarchy exists, of course, in non-capitalist arrangements, of course. Um, there is exploitation, but not of the capitalist <coughs> form. When things are being produced as commodities, it has very, very distressing results in terms of the social relations. So, in terms of the animal husbandry, the production, the mass Fordist production of, of chickens gives, a very, gives you a very, very unfortunate and episodic social relation to the animals in your care. It's impossible not to. Uh, in my family's farm in Ireland, it was clear if you talk to those who used to look after the pigs and the chickens in the old way, they, they were the, in fact very distressed at the massification, 
the new set of social relations when they had to start producing uh, uh, these animals as commodities. Is that helped? Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you. How are we doing? Are we are we uh, are we still going for a little bit? We're getting another. We'll take something else. We got. Days, no question. <laughs> this is a, a question for both of you. Do you believe that uh, after the economic failure and after the full blast of the crisis, uh, we are left with a deficit that is mainly moral and we have to? carry on that moral deficit that was not ours in the first hand and uh, that we have to deal with that not only with a financial uh, deficit but we have to deal with a uh, moral deficit I mean um, probably 10-20 years ago being a radical ecologist for example could be uh, sensed as a very liberal very uh, very modern in a, in a way and um, militant way to follow, path to follow. But now, isn't that much more regressive? Isn't it a new religion coming up very strong and that we are now, the old ecologists are becoming its new evangelists? Isn't it something retrograde, this? Yeah, thanks. Well, I, I mean, it can be. Um, uh, uh, there's there's a lot of complicated uh, aspects to this, but um, if if we take uh, if we take seriously what um, science um, is telling us, uh, then um, you know, warming exists at a at a rate that uh, is going to clearly produce social effects. Those those climate scientists are not. Uh, their task is not to tell us exactly what the social effects are, but um, I, I think they're, they're likely to be along the lines we said. So yeah, I mean, because uh, the, 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 the projected uh, scenarios are extreme, uh, we, we do enter into the realm of catastrophe and catastrophism uh, and invet evangelical um, you know, responses to that because it's a, it's a very scary uh, possible future. Um, certainly, that has that has to be taken into account um, all uh, uh, on every level, from the way we, we we think, as I tried to indicate in a very simple and quick way. But in in the way we construct the categories that we're using, first of all, beginning with nature and humanity, um, since it's about the relation between the two. Um, so yes, I think that that. What you describe is a, a danger that is inherent in this politics, not just the, the politics, but the reality that's unfolding. Um, what I meant to say by the sheer materiality or relentless materiality of, of biospheric meltdown um, is that the, uh, the, the, the physical aspects can't be avoided. They can be avoided politically for a time, rhetorically, um, you know, denialism can, can, can carry on. But at some point, uh, just the simple fact of, for example, rising waters or ocean acidification, the loss of fisheries, all these things are going to produce social effects that, that are as real as can be. And at that point, um, we're, we're, not, uh, we're not in the realm of fantasy or Hollywood doomsday scenarios. We're we're in um, the predicament of, of um, how do you manage a politics under conditions that are getting worse and worse when people are, are, are losing ground. And austerity teaches us that um, the, the rage and resentment that that necessarily produces 
are, are most easily politically channeled in very ugly ways. So that's just one point. Um, it, uh, when you first, the, the first part of your question made me think that maybe you were referring to um, the failure of, of party politics. Uh, was was to, to, to deal, was that, that was not? What maybe I didn't um, express myself well. I'm asking ab about the reframing of something radical who, which used to uh, be opposed to a materialistic way mm -hmm. that now is more of a policing. I mean, we all are now a new police force, alternative police force, who is trying to police the morality. We have, from being opposed to a certain materiality, to capitalism, to exploitation of nature or whatever, now we are be becoming uh, the new forces that speak about morality. So, so this is a, a change of the way that w we also live. Okay. Now, okay, I see what you're saying. I mean, I, okay, I, I, I'm going to give it to Ian, but just, just one, one further, um, one further point about it. I, I think, I think it's a mistake um, to, to, um, to shift the whole debate into the moral and ethical, you know, moralistic ethical uh, register. Certainly, um, there, there, there is that dimension of, um, you know, our, our behavior and approach um, to nature as it, as it is presented to us in everyday life. So for example, ethical consumerism and so on. I, I don't think these can solve the problem. It's not, in, it's not so useful to, to have the debate at that level um, because the problem is bigger than that. Uh, so so um, I wouldn't want to limit it to that. But when we're in that register, then we have all the risks of a moral discourse uh, and the abuses, the possible abuses. Uh, evangelical, yeah, that's 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 one possibility. Not the only one, though. I mean, it's, it doesn't seem to me inevitable that it goes in that direction. Yeah. yeah. Um, guess we're drawing to a close here. But yeah, thank you. These are this is a good challenge. Uh, just a couple of words f uh, about. Uh, Yeah, the meltdown, the, the crisis of nature, um, catastrophe. I don't think I can do better than, than point you to the new book by, uh, put together by three of the retort gang, just called Catastrophism, which takes on the, the, the discourse of disaster. I, I think what history, of, uh, the history we've been talking about shows us that uh, of course, for untold millions, the catastrophe has already happened. I mean, <laughs> it is one long, you know, the angel of history kind of thing. Yeah, it is. But there is a new inflection now uh, in relation to... Um, it, it is possible to scare oneself. I work um, in a in an earth sciences building and talking to geologists and glaciologists, it's, it, can, it can almost be paralyzing uh, to realize, for example, if it's true uh, that the West Antarctic ice sheet um, is melting, as it were, autonomously, independent of the atmospheric conditions, the internal dynamics uh, and if that really does melt, it's a very large block of ice. And it will mean the, a global rise of um, maybe 20 meters, uh, which means the end of coastal civilization, including Athens. Um, but when you ask a glaciologist, well, <laughs> when, when should we expect this, if it's true? Um, they don't really know. I mean, Kurt Cuffey, who is the glaciologist best known to me, he says, well, it could be 60 years, it could be 600. We just don't know the, s the pace and scale of these things. But certainly it's a very daunting proposition. Um, and what is interesting, of course, is since Copenhagen, it's clear that they don't really have um, a plan B uh, in that sense. So that's catastrophism. Um, 
I mean, we're all catastrophists now in some way or another, I think, because of the popular culture. I mean, um, nature was just a backdrop. When I, f when I arrived in Berkeley, it was taught uh, in, in uh, the department that I work in as uh, nature, yeah, was just a backdrop on which the human drama played out. There had been a victory over Christian catastrophism, which said that the whole deal was only six millennia, you know, and uh, we were living in the end times. What was odd about going to Copenhagen was to find that after this victory by scientists to say, well, there's an open future, and we've got a, we've got a couple of billion years left, or more. It was odd to find scientists in Copenhagen in 2009, you know, thumping the table saying, the end is nigh. They were sounding like a priesthood, you know, wake up. Um, so we've got to be careful about the rhetoric there. And then just finally on moral discourse, the question of the moral dimension in relation, say, to debt. Um, uh, the wage form, the commodity form, the common form, they imply complex set of social relations that it is up to us to investigate, to invent new forms of commoning, of sociability for sure, of relating to the material substrate. Um, the debt form is very interesting, so that it's often hard in a room like this to get people to talk about their relationship to lenders in ways that emphasize our commonality. Um, there's often a moral dimension interfering with solidarity in relation to debt, which sure as hell is systematic, okay, and systemic now, right? So that, for example, there's a tendency to judge harshly those who go into credit card debt because they're unthrifty spenders, whereas somebody who, who certainly it's true in the United States and must be true here, somebody who's experiencing uh, uh, medical debt, medical debt, a catastrophe in life circumstances because of um, catastrophic uh, events in relation to illness or cancer, there's not much moral judgment made against them. So there's, a, there's, there's important work to be done uh, in, in relation to the, the moral question and its relationship to the new discursive formations and the, the poetics, as Jean and I were discussing, the poetics of of comedy. God knows they've got the best tunes with the commodity, the poetics of the commodity. I mean, God knows we are, you know, we're still drowning in the poetics of the commodity. It's killing us. I mean, literally, the, the, the lead, the gloss, the politics of gloss, of capitalist surface and gloss, right? So, for us now, I, 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 I want to invite you to, to, to join in the, the larger project of, of uh, excavating these histories, uh, establishing new sets of social relations, rejecting this horrible moralistic, moralistic uh, discourse in relation to debt, uh, to read about the history of debt, of jubilee as, as a normal form. It's the form which capitalists extend to each other, for God's sake, the forgiveness uh, of debt. They're happy to send it out into a secondary market at 1%, right, to the vultures who go and collect it. They write off 99 cents in the dollar without moralizing, taking a big haircut, whatever. Um, so we have a big task uh, in, in front of us and uh, yeah so just personally I want to say you know thank you 
so much for bearing with us. And please come and visit us at Mayday Rooms, Mikasa Sukasa.